Hello, welcome to Embedded Programming. And my name is Viral, and I am working on building a simple robotic platform using the Go programming language as the way to control it and hopefully be able to have a robotic platform that is Wi-Fi enabled so that I can control it um, remotely. Now, I've went through a lot of the different ways in which I can get a board that has Wi-Fi support and still be able to control like a motor and so on. And I eventually arrived at what I have here, which is this Raspberry Pi with um, built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Um, I don't think I'll need Bluetooth anytime soon, but it's good to have it. And this motor control board that also um, that is available. And so from my last video, you probably saw me try and play with the Raspberry Pi. I installed the operating system Raspbian using Noob's um, installer. And this time I'm gonna redo the installation. I'll show you a different way of installing it, which is probably a little bit easier. Um, I went through some of the features of this board already. So here in part two, I'll try to see if I can go a little bit further and show you exactly how I intend to, now that I'm using Raspberry Pi, um, and it's going to be a full-fledged operating system or I can still do the remote development which is what I wanted to be able to do with GoBot and you know run the application from my desktop and then have it talk to or something like that and then have it talk to the robot. So let me get started. Um, so I've just mated this together but let me show you how I'm gonna redo that setup. So if you go to raspberrypi.org um, and you go to download, and I show you how to do some of this before. Last time I used Noobs to do the installation. This time, what I did was I went to Raspbian because I selected Raspbian anyway. And what I did is I, since my robot is not gonna be connected to a monitor, um, which is my Raspberry Pi to say that it's not gonna connect it to a monitor, it's gonna be on this mobile platform, I don't want to allocate resources, CPU cycle, energy, whatever, to run in a desktop. So I did not choose these desktop option. Instead, I choose the Raspbian Buster Lite. And so after downloading that, I then extracted it to a my SD card. Now, I strongly suggest that you go through um, the installation guide here, and it tells you exactly what to do. It tells you where to get um, a thing to un unpack the archive on the Mac or any other um, distribution. It also tell you how to use um, this etcher, um, Balina etcher, which you can download for free again for all the three platforms. And that is exactly what I use to burn the, and as a matter of fact, you don't even need to unzip it. Um, this thing would actually, um, as you can see here, um, burn the, or write the image to the SD card, even if it's in a zip file. So literally just download and then use this etcher to write it to your SD card. And so once I did that, the other thing I did was I went back to the documentation page here. Let me zoom in a little bit. And I went to remote access and it says, you know, because I want to access my Raspberry Pi once it's up and running over SSH, and I'll show you, it's not only so I can log into it, is I'm gonna do the development remotely with Visual Studio Code. And so we want SSH server enable. And so if you click on this, it tell you that how you can um, enable the SSH server, but if, and the last time I did it this way because we were running and we were connected, but then you can also set it up using like this headless setup. And this headless setup means that you simply create a file call that um, create an empty file, SSH. It doesn't even matter what's inside the file. What happens is when Raspberry Pi boots up, it looks for this file, and if it sees it, then it um, to enable SSH, and then it deletes the file. So this is nice to have. The other thing to note is that you must put this on the boot partition of your SD card. After you write your SD card, you will see that how it's going to say, let me show you. So if I go there and uh, let's see, boot. So here, once you write it to the SD card, you'll see that how it's gonna have this boot drive that you can just write um, stuff to. And there's my SD card and you can see it's zero bytes. There's nothing in it, I just have the file. The other file that I created was this 
PA supplicant that config file. Now I'm not going to show you what's inside my file, but it's fairly easy file to, to write. Again, you just create the second file on your, um, in that boot file partition. And basically that is so that you can, I think I went to configuration for that one. So configuration, and that is to wireless networking, right? And so if you go here and you go headless set, setup, and you scroll along, you'll see it out. That's that WPA on the score supplicant that config file. And again, you put it in the um, boot folder, which is where I just showed you. And you put this file with this content inside, assuming that you're in the US. If you're not, you'll change your country code, but then your wireless ID that you want your Raspberry Pi to connect to and your password. But once you have that, they also tell you how to enable SSH, which I already showed you. And so now I have my um, Raspberry Pi configured this way. I'm going to eject this because I show you how I configure it. And I'm going to install it into my Raspberry Pi boot up and then see if I can find it. So there's that going in there. I just ejected it. And let's see, get some power here. Now, the last time I boot up my Raspberry Pi, um, I don't remember what the IP address is. I can probably look it up. Um, so yeah, so I plug that in. That's gonna boot for a while. Oh, yeah, come on. And so let's try to keep that over there. And hopefully it's not too bright and uh, white out. I tried to mute the light a little bit. So I've just started up my Raspberry Pi. So now I need to determine my IP address. For that, you go back to documentation and then click on remote access and then look at, uh, click on IP address. Let me zoom in there a little bit more. And then this talks about how to, in order to connect to your Raspberry Pi from another machine using SSH, which is what we want, you'll need to know its IP address. So there are a couple of ways you can do it. And one of the easiest I find that works for me is to do this. So run this ping command. If you just highlight this and copy it or type it, doesn't really matter. And you do like this, you ping, type ping. And as you can see, it shows that my um, Raspberry Pi IP address is this guy. So now that I know how to reach my Raspberry Pi, I can sort of use that host name or I can just use the IP address. Okay, so that's great. Now. In order to set up, so we can SSH. So I can do SSH and then I think it's like, okay, so let's do it. Pi at, you know, let's do a Raspberry. Um, actually, let me just type the IP address. 10.10.100.183. And then, oh, because I have this in my file already because I can connect it to this before. So I have to remove this from my file. So let me do, which line is it on? Is it line 40? So now that I've fixed that, let's try this login again. So there we go, yes, and Raspberry. And I'm connected. Okay, so this is one way I'm on the Raspberry Pi. I can type uni minus A. You should see all this kind of information that tells me that oh, I'm running on a Raspberry Pi, and this is an ARM processor and all this other stuff. So that's one way to do it. The other thing you can do if you want to do passwordless login, which is where you should set up if you want to follow me and do the Go um, development from your desktop. And what you do is you type this. If you do not have an SSH key already and you're on a Unix-like platform, you should be able to write SSH key gen and just follow the prompt. Just press enter, follow the prompt, do not type a password. If you are on Windows, then you need to follow some way of setting up SSH key gen. Don't worry. Here is the documentation for that. You can go to VS Code Remote SSH, and I think this should take you to the documentation. And if we go to Remote Development SSH for VS Code, and here it will tell you how to set up SSH on Windows. And so somewhere in here, it tells you how to set up SSH on Windows. And so this is the documentation you really need to follow to get your entire environment set up. And you can see this is what we're doing. We're gonna be running Linux um, VS Code locally on our desktop, and we'll be SSH over to our Raspberry Pi where we're gonna do the development. So you can just follow this documentation to do everything. Now, 
if since I have a SSH key already, what I can do is type ssh.copy. And then now I want to copy it to rpy or pi rather at 10.10.100.183. And I enter that and it asks me for the password. I type it again, raspberry. And notice it says it copy the key. So if I do SSH again, I try to SSH there. Notice how I can log in now without password. So this is called passwordless login. All right, good. So we have our passwordless login working. So what does this have to do with development? Well, um, what I can do is start Visual Studio Code. So let me exit once again from here because I don't need to be over there. And not now anyway. And so let's copy minus R our part one and we'll make it part two and i'll go into the part two directory i'll type visual studio code and this is my local development uh, i really don't need to be in this directory because i want to copy some of the code that's why i'm in this directory and if you do not have this plugin yet if you don't see this icon um, that says remote explorer what you want to do is go to plugins and then search for remote ssh right and then this is going to come up remote ssh explorer and so you install that and uh, remote ssh editing you install these two now if you're in a windows machine so remote ssh remote ssh explorer and remote ssh editing if you are on windows what's this one nightly um, i don't need that nightly if you're on windows you might be using windows for linux subsystem for linux you might install that um, i did not install that i also install remote container because We'll be doing that for Go on the Run, but see if you follow me for Go on the Run, you might want to install that now too. But for this embedded stuff, we're just doing remote SSH to um, that box. So once you have that installed, you'll get this guy. And once you have this, you can then um, click on this, and then you'll see it says um, users that you know my that SSH config file, and you can edit your config file to put in these host name that you want to connect to, or you can simply, let's do this, let's escape. What you can do, I'm gonna close this. What you can do is click at the bottom here, and it just comes up and it says, remote SSH connect to host. And you can click on that, and I can type R, um, pi at 10.10.100.183. And then I can just enter, and you'll see that how it starts connecting. And say so it oh, uses a new window. Of course, just now I think it gave me an option to use the existing windows, the existing window that I have open. And so I'll leave that in the background. Let me just resize this a little bit. I'll leave this somewhere here just in case I want anything from it. So I have two windows open now. And so it connected to my Raspberry Pi. And notice the terminal is on my Raspberry Pi. So I can stay from right within here and work on my Raspberry Pi. Notice my Visual Studio Code is still running on my Mac, but I'm connected to the Raspberry Pi. Um, so one of the things you will want to do is install some plugin that you need to work with. Um, so for example, since we're doing Go development, I'll look for the plugins that you have here and then see which one you need to install remotely. So for example, I like my colorized bracket. And so it looked like I don't need to install that one. Um, I'm just going through the list. Um, my output colorizer, that also doesn't need to be installed. I don't need to do remote development over there, install those plugins. I don't need the Angular stuff over there. Um, da, 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 da. C++ stuff, I'm not gonna be doing C++ code runner. I can install that. So that install it. Notice how it shows me. It's installed locally and it's also installed remotely and I could restart. Um, the other thing I need is my Go stuff. Okay, so I want Git graph, Git history remotely because I'm gonna have Git directories, Git lens, uh, Git and don't ignore why not, and then Go. Here's my Go um, plugin that I need over there. Well, I would like to have, and if I scroll along really quickly, um, nothing else that I think I really need over there right now. So for now, oh, pretty, pretty your code. Yep, let's do that. Uh, rainbow brackets. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So I think that's about it. So those are my plugins that I have installed locally, but I want them installed 
on this Raspberry Pi and notice it's doing it, it's installing it. All right, um, it's telling me that, oh, I need to restart for these plugins to take effect. So let's do restart. And there you go, and it's fine. All right, I don't have anything outstanding now. Now this open folder, so one of the things I can do is, I don't know, unable to find Git executable. So it's telling me that Git is not installed on my remote thing. So I can do sudo, I believe, and I can do apt install minus y git. And let's see if that installs it for me. And yes, it does. All right, so the other thing I'm going to install is Go. Um, there should be a package called Go, maybe Golang. All right, installation successful. All right, so let's clean up our screen. And I don't have any directory here, so let's create a development directory to run our Go code. So let's make a directory P and let's call it like Striversity and let's call it uh, GoBot. Uh, what did we call this? We say that uh, we're developing a you know robot. Um, this is robot platform. Okay, let's call it robot revision one. So let's keep it simple. Um, all right, and so maybe in this directory, we should make a directory for what we're going to be doing, and let's just call this setup or test. All right, so. Let's call this setup. So let's set up. Ah, MK directory setup. MKDIR setup. So this is our setup example. And if we do open folder, as you can see, here's my Straversity directory. And so Straversity. Now, if I select Straversity, it's going to allow me to navigate down to the directory we want. And then I can say, OK. And now it opens um, that directory. And of course, there's nothing in it. We can create a directory called CMD, for example. And notice all the stuff that I'm doing here on my local machine is being reflected over on the Raspberry Pi. So if I open up uh, my terminal again and I do a ls, I should see a CMD directory. Now, if I watch this, for example, um, for example, watch minus D and then ls minus LR, for example, LR recursively. And I do like this, we will see it. So as I create files here in my browser, I remember this terminal is an SSH to the Raspberry Pi. So let's create a simple test program, main.go. And of course, we'll do package main. And this is a little too big. So let's reduce the font size there. Um, not too small. And function main and there. So what this is telling me is it needs those go um, those out of um, programs for Go installation, and for some reason uh, they're failing. I'm not sure why they're all failing. And so now we can assume that all our tools are installed. So let's clean up our screen here. So now that we have that, um, if I close this and I reopen my Go application, I shouldn't see that message and I don't see that message telling me. So let's open up the bottom here a little bit. So the whole thing zoom in when I try to zoom in the bottom, but that's okay. Uh, I think this is way too big. All right, so now let's see. So if I do fmt.println and I do hello from um, rpy and you know save that, and then it imports my FMT package. Of course, it's imported um, because I have the tools now. And then I can right click and say run code because I have that plugin. And this is going to run it remotely on the Raspberry Pi. Um, we can also, of course, go to the command line and do go cd into the CMD directory. And then we can do go run and main. And so this is run on the Raspberry Pi, and so we're good. So we're able to do the development on the Raspberry Pi. Um, what I'd like to be able to do is to be able to run our code that we had from before. And so if you remember, um, we're in this directory, and we had this bit of code. We had, um, so why don't we copy our Go mod, which is the RPI one. So let's copy that. 
let's come over here and paste it in this directory and let's see paste and nice it pressed it over there um, which again I say it's really cool that we can you know be on our system and then copy stuff over to the other side so uh, go back up one directory yeah. and run this and we can see there's our go um, mod file go that mod file and then the other thing I want is our example and so um, we're not going to worry about this one that we created delete this this is just a test and so this there we go that's gone and now we can copy over the one that we have here which is copy and paste that in our cmd directory and so that should show up great um i don't think we need to have this window open anymore because we've copied the code that we want and so now we can just focus on working on this side and so let me close this i don't need this to be running that was just to show you how nice and cool it is for us to be able to be on our desktop and copy stuff remotely and have that all taken care of taken care of for us so we have this new adapter which we get from the raspberry pi platform because that's what we're using and we run the code that was blinking led 7. so the only thing we need to do now is figure out how to control what do we need to do to control the motors so what i'll do is i'll pause here and when i come back i'll have power connected this guy well through this connected con this so i um, screwed in here so i can connect power for the motor and then i'll have two motors connected motor one and motor two these guys connected to motor one and motor two and then we'll look up the documentation for this board and see which gpios we need to toggle and what's not in order to see if we can get those wheels turning so that's the goal so see you after i done set up everything so okay um welcome back so i have everything wired up i have this is motor one two three and four it really doesn't matter which one we use but whatever i try to keep it consistent so uh this is motor one motor two and then i've wired up um power supply um, leads here. And I haven't connected to the battery yet. What I'll do is I'll power it up first and then um, power up the Raspberry Pi and then I'll connect the power. Uh, I should probably connect power just to make sure so nothing doesn't blow up, but I think it's gonna be fine. Um, if you look here, you see there's a jumper and it's off, there's nothing connected to it. And so this, would be the jumper that you would use to supply, supply voltage from your um, motor shield to your Raspberry Pi. But since it's off, it means that I'm supply separate voltage. Now, if I show you my screen, which motor shield I'm using, um, I'm using this SB components, which you can see the name on the shield also. I'm using this SB component motor shield. It's the same thing. Um, I bought it online. It's fairly cheap. Actually, it was cheap. It's cheaper than the ones that we bought for like Raspberry Pi and so on. But anyway, um, not Raspberry Pi, Arduino. Um, so this one mates nicely with the Raspberry, um, with the Raspberry Pi. And like I said, the Raspberry Pi I got was the A plus board. Um, slightly different shape than this one that you're seeing in the picture. And that's because I don't need these extra like RJ45 and all the USB ports. I mean, I could probably have used the USB port, but really don't need them. Um, and then if you look at some of the features of this board, right? So it's dual age bridge IC chip, which is this L293D. We've seen this chip or its cousin in almost all the shields we've played with. And so it can control up to four DC motor or two stepper motors. Um, input voltage range is six to 24 volts. So that's nice. We have a 11 point something volts power support battery. Um, the current, um, you know, 600 and peak one amp. That sh I think should be okay for these motors that I have. I did not check. Um, this is significantly lower than the MD5 um, motor control board that we have that can do up to I think like 30 amps peak and um, I think like three amps continuous. So um, we'll see if I burn out the motors or, or the motor burn out the board. We'll, we'll see. This is a learning exercise for everybody. Uh, onboard LED for indicating motor direction and stuff. That's always sort of nice. Um, two infrared sensor, and those are going to be 
um, these guys here, the yellow ones. Um, then one ultrasonic connector um, that's in the middle of here. And we'll try and use those since we're making a robot. We should be able to tell distance to object and so on. So those are going to come in handy, those two sensors. Uh, mail error screw terminal for battery supply. Well, those are, you know, that's there. And on poor onboard GPIO, um, GPIO stacking header. So just basically, you know, you can stack even more and more other shields or hat onto the Raspberry Pi. So in terms of documentation, it says here, go to this GitHub page, you're going to find schematic documentation and so on. So I went over there and this is what's available. And the readme um, says, well, you can see in the GitHub repository, it is the manual, um, the GPIO, GUI Moto Shield, um, that PY. So there's a bunch of Python files here, um, the stepper, stepper motor manual, um, motor shield schematic and so on. Um, so make a spare manual. I don't know what that is, but okay. But it says this, if you clone it, so let's do that. If you clone it and you go into this home Pi directory and then test motor that PY, it should test all the motors and run them forward, backwards and so on. And so we should probably do that before we try and figure out what we, how we can control this from Go. So, okay. So what you're seeing here is because I had to power down the shield to connect it and the Raspberry Pi, well, um, I no longer have connection. So let me power this back up. I should have done that while I was talking to you. Uh, so let's get this powered up. Where is... So there we go. Um, so... That should be booting up there. You can see a green light blinking. So that's booting up. Um, the red one is the power. That green is like the activity light when it's doing stuff. I don't know if it's um, Ethernet activity, but it seems like when it's reading the SD card. And then this is the LED, power LED for the board. Okay, so that is that. Let me see if um, we can make connection to our board. If you remember, we figure out that my IP address was this, but we also figure out that we can do ping um, raspberry pi that local, and that should also work. So great, I'm connected, the board is up. So let's do reconnect, retry, and let's see. And in the previous video, um, before I paused it, we um, saw how to install all the Go tools and everything. So that should all be set. All right, so we're all set up for development. And to open our folder, we have a folder here we call Traversity Robot One Setup. And so let's open that. And once this loads, we have a main.go that we were working with in part one. So that's fine. We could run this and blink, you know, the LED if we want, but we're not gonna do that because we already demonstrated that we could run Go code on this board and do all that stuff. What we wanna be able to do though, is do that clone so let's go back up um, and do um, so I don't want to put this as part of my repository so I'll put this in the home directory I'll do git clone so I paste the entire thing and so let's download that okay and let's go into motor shield and I'm just following the direction so let's say Python and they said test motor so let's do that and let's see what happened let me grab a hold of this board oh I need to connect motor power. So let's hope we nothing explodes here. And this is connected. And so far, nothing, everything seems nice and warm. Um, nice and cool, sorry, not warm. And so let's run. Oh, look at that. That's sweet. You can see it is going pretty fast. And what is this? There's stop. Okay. And I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Stop again. Moving forward. So forward. Well, for me, this both wheels are running, turning backwards. Or oh, one wheel. Okay. And spinning in reverse. Yep. So it's spinning a different direction. Um, forward. Forward doesn't seem to work. Nothing is happening there. Um, hmm. so not sure. So, okay, stop seems to be fine. We will we'll have to, um, do our own controls to see, um, 
it seems like it's working um, except when it had let's see so that's left right let me see forward reverse so right seems to be working um, for some strange reason that's stop uh, left doesn't seem to be working so that's forward both wheels are going both wheels are going the other direction backwards that's fine we can always change the wiring so here is left and nothing is happening and then once we will try to make sure we can control all the motors and if we can then the shield is good if not then maybe i need to buy another shield because i think i really like the shield um i especially like that how there's this jumper that you can use to power up your board if you remember i complained for the arduino shield that oh you have to cut the trace instead of having a jumper so anyway let's see so we need some documentation to, to understand what's going on and so um if we look at if we grab this the gui manual maybe it's in this so let's see okay apparently if you have the graphical desktop you can um if you have a desktop you can use it to control the motor you can run this gui application we don't have that um i click on motor shield schematic here and so let's take a look at a schematic let me see if i can zoom in so yeah zoom in a little bit maybe zoom in a little bit more okay so if we look at the schematic it's not very complicated these are the header blocks to connect the motors and we can see motor 1a motor 1b so okay so two pins going to the motor to change the direction and so on and if we look at where they come from motor 1a and motor 1b those come from here motor 1a and 1b and those are from pin 3 and 8 of this l293d chip so so that's good that's the output from this chip to control that one motor and then there's um the output for motor 2 um a and b okay great so if we look at the input so we can ignore all the other stuff ground vcc and all this other stuff let's look on the other side of this chip to control each motor each channel like motor one you have three pins you have in one in two and then you have enable one so from our experience fooling around with this sort of stuff before we can imagine that how this enable once this is one that's when the motor would do something um either turn forward or backwards and that is going to be dependent on what are two the values you have on these two pin if both of these are either one or zero then we know that how the motor wouldn't do anything but it's sort of like break and but if their opposite polarity like let's say in one is low and then in two is high maybe they might cause it to spin in one direction you toggle them it spins in the other direction but the minute they're both the same then it's different and then we can use the enable pin as sort of our speed pin because no matter how you would you set these two uh, once they're opposite polarity then if it's not enabled it wouldn't move so this tells us that how we need for motor one anyway motor one anyway we should use pin 13 15 and 11. so okay so let's go to our go code and figure that out now by the way here's the 40 pin error and if you remember when we we have some go code already so we have some go code before and we were blinking an led and we set it pin seven now we were a little bit confused because when we tried to see where pin seven was it was all the way it was the fourth pin over on this side which sort of makes sense here's pin seven now i found something that was really cool um and so if we go to raspberry pi and we go back to documentation and scroll along to hardware because we want to understand a little bit about this hardware and then we go to da, 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 let's say raspberry pi and we want to understand the gpio that we're using so we click here and so it tells you that oh, you know the gpi you have internal pull-ups and these are sort of things and they have alternative functions and so on but that's uh, a little bit boring what i found it really interesting was clicking on this gpio usage when i click on this it shows you those 40 pins but then there's this nice little picture here and as you can see um it tells you that this is five volts da 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 da, da. but look at what this is this is four well, when we look at the thing before, this was actually pin seven, right? So what is going on here? Well, I'll come back to that. So it tells you that, oh, you know, can you use the input or output? 
And here's the interesting thing too. As well as simple input and output devices, the GPIO pin can be used with a variety of alternative function. Some are available on all pins, others are on specific pins. So pulse width modulation, that's what we care about. Software pulse width modulation on all pins. Oh, software pulse width modulation. We like hardware pulse width modulation, but hey, if we can only get software, we'll take it. But that's available on all pins. Well, in terms of hardware pulse width modulation, we have pin 13, 12, 13, 18, and 19. Well, let's go back to our little diagram here. What did we say was tied to? Oh, so 13 was tied to this pin um, on the input pin. So uh, that's fine. We'll just have to use. I like the enable pin being my software, uh, my pulse width modulation. So I'll use that. Though it sort of doesn't matter because you can just enable the um, board and then you can still pulse these other, well, you can't really pulse it because since you're doing on and off, if you did that, then you'll be toggling it back and forth, which means you wouldn't actually move forward. You'd be sort of spinning it backward and forward depending on, well, you have to toggle this one. Yeah, it would be a mess to use this pin 13. So we cannot use the hardware um, pulse width modulation. So we'll have to use software pulse width modulation on pin 11, and we'll just have to use 13 and I keep forgetting. <laughs> we have to use um, 13 and 15 to just um, use that as our direction and then pin 11 as our speed. Okay, so that's fine. Um, so yeah, so then we, we can go through and read some of the other things that you can um, do. But if you look at this picture, well, this is a terrible picture to look at. Um, coming down, you can see there's this application called pin out. And with this application installing a Raspberry Pi, if you run it from the command line, a command line application, it shows you this little picture that you can see those two red there maps to these two red above here. And it goes across and show you all the pins and it tells you, um, you know, which one are, what's the GPIO. So notice pin seven that we were using is actually GPIO four. So when we want to use pin um, 13 and whatever else it is, 15 to control our motor direction, that's actually GPIO 27 and 22. And then we use in pin 11, which is this guy. So essentially it's these three pins that we use in to control motor A. This is speed, GPIO 17 and thing. But we don't really actually need to worry about these GPIOs, what the GPIO number is, because in GoBot, it's simply using the pin number. So all we have to remember is that we're using pin 11 for speed, 13 and 15 for direction. And if we go back here, we can see 11 for speed here and 13 and 15 for direction. Okay, so let's know that we have that information. Oh, if by the way, that application, this pinout application, you cannot, it's not installed in the version. If you follow my example and install um, Raspbian Lite version, it's not, it does not include um, the pinout. So let's let me connect to my board. Um, let's do that. And if I type pinout, it works because I install pinout. And so you can see there's that picture again. Um, and then uh, it's really nice to, and handy to have this. So we don't have to always go to the um, browser, but you can have a browser open too. And so we can have this pretty handy. Okay, so how do you install this? Well, what you do is you go to this website. I did a little bit of Googling how to install um, Raspberry Pi pin out um, application. And this is all you do. You do app get update. You just literally copy these two commands and run them. I run this one. And after it completed, I had the pin out application. So you can do that if you want to have, be able to have this. Okay, so let's continue so we don't waste too much time. And so let's go to our Go code now. And so oh, let's close this for a little bit. Um, delete this. And so this is set up. And so what we would like to use is not a new LED adapter, but rather 
we'd like to use GPIO new motor. I don't need I mean, they mean to minimize. Um, new motor. So let's see. This is still something else to install. So let's see if it installs. Okay, command failed. Uh, why it failed, I do not know, but I'll copy it. I don't know why these commands are failing to install. Um, so I'll copy it, paste it, and run it myself. Okay, and it seemed to work. Um, I don't know. Okay. So close this, get rid of this, and so it's to new motor driver. Um, I think it's new motor driver was the name of that thing. And so for the motor driver, we have to say, give it a, the, the adapter, which is R and then speed pin. Now remember what we had. So we had, let's do, um, const and let's do, um, motor a speed pin was equals to 11, uh, motor a direction one is equals was equals to 13 if i'm not mistaken motor direction two was equals to pin 15 and we can easy verify that by going back here and we saw that i was 11 13 and 15. all right so if we use as our speed pin motor a speed pin then we can say we're going to change this from saying LED to so say oh, this is motor A. And then we can we have to configure our direction pin. So motor A, right, come on, motor A that direction. So we want to be able to set the direction. So come on. All right, I'm not getting my con. I'm not getting um assistance here with the control, but okay. Let's just go look at the documentation for this. Um, so there we are. So we want to set pin direction um, forward and backwards pin. That's what we want to set because we don't have one direction pin, but we rather actually have two. So we have set forward and backward. And if we look at these, um, we don't actually have any methods to call to set them. We just simply assign um, the pins to the value, forward pin and backward pin. Okay, so uh, let's see, forward pin, backwards pin. So let's go back here and just say forward pin is equals to motor A direction one and motor A, that backward pin is equals to motor direction two. All right, so once we set that now, this is our work function. What we would like to do is to be able to drive our motor forward or backward for a little bit. Now, we have we have this code already, and so there's no point in us really rewriting this code. So if I go back to some of our older code that we have, and I go up a bit a little bit, and we go back to section five, where we do now this motor control stuff. If we go into any one of our last set of projects, we can go to any one. We can go th to three, for example. Um, yeah, all right, let's do four. The, oh, the Citron board. Yeah, part three. Um, part three. And if we do code and we did Arduino and we have the ESP8266, but let's do Arduino. Let's open this up. And now example one, we try to control the motor speed using the direct pin driver. I want to skip all of that and just go straight to controlling the motor using the motor controller, using the direct pin driver. I don't want to do that. 
let's do using motor driver so this is motor driver okay so let me copy some of this code copy this and i'm going to go over back to this side of our um, thing and paste it here and so i have two main at this point and um let's do we need some of this stuff like this or a log package and time package i think so let's do it do that i'm gonna get rid of this now because i see that all we have it below i'm gonna get rid of the main that we we're trying to write just now and just reuse the code that we had from before and so if i save that now see import uh that, that's ugly that's not what i want so import closes there this is not part of the import we're not trying to import this anymore all right save that and let's bring in our documentation here okay so we're trying to control the Raspberry Pi and the shield circuit is well we don't actually have a circuit but so Raspberry Pi motor A speed and dash and using yeah let's leave it's dismissed um, reconnect now oh, okay come on did I lose my connection to my board uh, looks that way oh man disconnected from 183 why it's complicated okay so here's our code all right and so we don't this doesn't matter default port doesn't matter because we're not using like um for matter to connect to our board so we don't need a connection and this is motor a um we, but for this board we know that all we have um the speed and then we have direction so we have speed and we have direction one and two so we have direction one and direction two. And so for motor A, the GPIO is 11 for speed, 13 for one direction and 15 for the other direction. Okay. And then we have something similar for B, even though we're gonna figure out what the p pins are for B in a minute. All right, so for motor A, let's see, pulse width modulation is what we call it here. That's fine. We're gonna say 11 and this is 13. And then we call it pin one, pin two, and so this is 15. I'm not gonna get tricked with that again. I'm gonna leave that alone. And so I will assume all of that is fine. Okay, we create motor with driver, and we said direction pin, but we say we wanna do forward pin, and that's gonna be pin one. And then we have to do backwards pin, which is pin two. All right, so come on, close. I gotta try and figure out what's up with the plugins and that error message. So why am I still getting, oh, okay, time. Okay, that's there twice. My modules, uh, for just my plug, Go plugin. Oh, man, compare, okay, fine. Um, okay, yeah, okay, resolve conflict. So let's do what's this check? Okay, yep, yeah. so that I want that one. Okay, sweet. Finally, it's hopefully it's gonna stop bugging me. I don't know why it keeps saying that. Okay, assuming that um, I have this correct. Mm. So our direction here chart is a little different. Um, for direction, we sort of know it, so we have direction one. Um, let me do this. And um, so let me 
me do this again. Come on. Oh, are you kidding me? So copy that. And then I will do this and do paste. So we have direction one, we have direction two. And I'll put a space in between there. Space here, space here, space there. All right, so we know if the enable pin or PWN pin, we can call it PWN here, is zero, it doesn't really matter, the motor is off. If it's one and our direction pin is zero and this guy is zero, then the motor is also off. So we sort of know this is, if this is one and these are the two guys, are zero or rather if that's zero it doesn't really matter what this is and same thing if these guys are both one then it sort of doesn't matter um, what happening with a positive modulation pin but if a positive modulation pin is one and this is zero and this is one then it's going in one direction if this is one um, and this guy is zero, then it's going in the other direction, right? It's motor's on. And we don't care if it's forward or backward because we can just adjust the pin, um, the poles and the motor. All right, so I think we're good. This is this was so much harder than I thought it would be. Um, the whole disconnecting thing really threw me off. All right, so let's see if we can run our code now. Our code should be fine now because we've been through this code already. Just for the sake of review, um, this part of it is just initializing that um, driver. Oh, we have formatter. Oh man, that's the difference. We don't want to use formatter. We want to use um, a Raspberry Pi as the platform. And I think that was called RPI. RasPi, I think it was called. And it was just new adapter. And we didn't have a port. Um, so there's no reason to, to have any of this code here because we don't have a port. And let's do save. And yeah, so I think this was it. Oh, why is it gone back to formatter? Oh, so our raspi, I think, is the thing we're using. Yep, there we go. All right. So now it seems like it's happy. Okay, so Raspberry Pi new adapter, GPIO is still the same motor control GPIO, speed pin, back and forward pin, and then we just do some code to test, test forward and backward. And, you know, we've done this before. So um, let's hope that it works now. So let's go here, maybe we can run it from here. Actually, let's go back inside our um, editor here and then open up the terminal and so you're already in this directory uh, let's go to cmd and let's do go run main and let's see what's gonna happen I press enter and I heard a little something just now oh, okay um, well nothing so far um, that did not work like I expected. Okay. I was going to see if there, I hear any sound. There's a little bit of a sound. Let's see. Okay, that did not work. Um, <laughs> not sure. But okay, uh, that's it. I will cut it here. Take care. Bye. I'll have more to say when I figure out what's going on.